So welcome to this Sunday service for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. Uh, before we get started with the program, though, uh, we'd like to say hello to everybody. So let's start with uh, Sister Renee, uh, also affectionately known as the Untwisted Sister. Hey, you guys. Uh, sorry you couldn't hear me earlier. I don't know if you've noticed, we've gotten a new system for my ministry. Uh, we've got the iMac here, better quality audio and video, and I'm starting to learn this week Final Cut Pro. So I'll be making better quality edited videos in the future, um, hoping to transfer some of my uh, uh, video content into things that are easily understood, more compact, and maybe have, uh, you know, have the scripture on, on uh, camera. So uh, unfortunately, you can see more of my messy house. Uh, sorry, the camera has a wider angle. Please let me know if there's any audio or video issues since this is a new system, but I am always happy to be here and I'm excited about the service. Okay, thank you, sister. All right, Brother Ben, will you uh, greet the congregation? Yes, it's good to be here today. And uh, Renee, you've never looked better. So yeah, and I'm very much looking forward to the service. Mm -hmm. Heather says, uh, you look lovely, Renee. Um, do, I, do I look lovely? Apparently I don't. He's got that. What'd you do to your face? Y'all notice he has no hair? Well, I I decided to wash my face, and when I oh, I, I used lye soap, and the beard came off. Oh, that's what it is. <laughs> I thought somebody put nair on your in your shaving can. Yeah. Now that was not a lie. That was known as a joke. <laughs> don't don't uh, mark it down as Luke lied today. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so we've said hello to everybody, and normally uh, right now uh, we'd have Matthias here saying hello to everybody. And Matthias is not going to be with us today. Um, so I guess I better uh, make an announcement. And it's an announcement that I never wanted to make. But um, yesterday, Matthias called me up and explained to me that he was going to withdraw from participating in CES programs. And uh, we've, we've had a couple of lengthy talks about this. And uh, he finally decided that uh, he wanted to leave. And I said, well, what do you want me to tell the congregation uh, uh, about what, why you're leaving and what, uh, what you're gonna do? And he said, well, let everybody know that um, I wanna focus on the Talk and Doctrine channel. Uh, and so that's what he's gonna be doing. Uh, if you haven't, uh, we're not familiar with this channel, Talk and Doctrine. I hope you'll subscribe to it and, and check it out. But um, on the Talk and Doctrine channel, uh, primarily what he does is uh, he talks doctrine with people. He has an invited guest, and oftentimes they disagree on something. And he's been very good at, at being able to talk to people he disagrees with and have a cordial conversation. And so that's what he's going to be pursuing. But I think the other thing he'll be doing on the, the Talk and Doctrine channel and in the future is really uh, focusing on, I think, two priorities. Uh, that are, I, I think he, he feels that this is his calling. Um, uh, he has coined the phrase, the, the doubtless gospel. Uh, and also, uh, I believe he coined the phrase decisionism. Uh, these two things are very important to him. And uh, I think that's what his emphasis going, is going to be. And uh, that's, the, that's the venue he thinks is best to uh, uh, go, go forward. So uh, it's going to feel strange without him. Uh, I will all miss him because we love him and I always will. Uh, he'll help start CES. Uh, he's been a very important part to this uh, ministry and that eventually evolved into a church and uh, this is the first Sunday program that he's missed. Uh, so uh, I will miss him. And uh, let's, uh, I hope everybody will subscribe to his channel if you haven't already. And, and tune in, look for his programs and, and, and support him. And, and uh, um, all right, let, let me ask Renee if uh, there's something you'd like to say. Yeah, um, we've all been together for quite a few years now. So. Needless to say, I'm very sad about it. I had a, 
a knot in my throat. My stomach felt upset because I just I didn't want us to break up, you know. So um, I'm I'm sad. I I I can't just because I disagree with someone. I I don't um, make someone being in agreement with me part of you know my affection for them. Just like we none of us do. Um, so he he will be. Uh, still doing my Thursday program and occasionally he'll chime in on that. Uh, so I'm, you know, he'll still be in my life and I hope in all of our lives, but uh, I'm, I'm very sad uh, to see this change after all these years. And um, I do believe in our uh, charity, unity and liberty. I hope that we can continue to be an example of that. And, uh, I, you know, I just want to publicly state that I love Matthias, uh, regardless of any um, public disagreement we may have. I, I never have had any animosity, nothing but love and uh, and respect for him. So I just want that to be public for me. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you, sister. Uh, all right, then. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, the Wednesday uh, Bible study and the uh, Friday fellowship uh uh, we'll continue as usual also, but uh, um, I guess uh, the next thing we would normally do on this Sunday service is uh, ask for your prayer needs. Um, Renee, are, are you aware of any prayer needs that you want to bring to our attention? Well, yeah, I, your family. Uh, I asked last night that you guys pray for Luke's family. He lost a family member to the virus. Um, I want to keep praying for Anthony Suarez, uh, who needs the kidney transplant and, uh, him and others are responsible for the ministry, having a uh, better quality equipment, uh, um, and are supporting the, getting the gospel out. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, Jennifer Petty still having health issues and sister Lisa, I'm very concerned about with her edema. This is, uh, I'm worried it's an underlying issue. But uh, she believes it's spiritual. It's very possible that it is. It's very painful to deal with. So please keep Sister Lisa uh, in prayers. Keep all of us on the panel in prayers. There's always something coming against anyone who stands firm on the gospel. There will always be something. Ugly things said about us, uh, public accusations, uh, health issues. There's always going to be something to take our attention off defending the faith wants to deliver unto the saints. In addition, I want to ask us to keep praying for Daniel uh, and his blood pressure issues because uh, those are serious. But uh, in general, all my viewers that struggle with OCD, anxiety, and chronic disability, uh, there's with this climate of fear, a lot of people are feeling isolated, alone, and afraid. And I ask that God give them strength and comfort and let us as believers also bear one another's burdens thus fulfilling the law of christ so i also pray that we step up and 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 commit to that thanks guys you're muted okay thank you uh sister renee uh in the chat room if you could uh focus on that and uh and uh, let me know if anybody in the chat room has any prayer needs they want to bring to our attention, uh, go ahead and post them in all caps now. And then Sister Renee will uh, let us know about that so we can announce those needs also. As for me uh, and the prayer needs, uh, I'd say the first thing I'd like to ask everybody to pray for is uh, to the blessings for uh, Matthias and Paula and their family and, and everything that they want to do going forward. Um, nothing but good for them. And um, for me personally, I'd like to have a, give a prayer of thanksgiving and praise because I'm, I'm so blessed that uh, I'm, my blood pressure medication has been adjusted several times and everything's just right now. So it's fine tuned and um, I'm doing really well. And so I've come a long way from the quadruple bypass heart surgery that we did in uh, that was uh, September 14th of 2017. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm just grateful, very thankful for all my blessings. And I certainly one of the most 
important things to me is the blessing of this congregation. It, uh, I, I know how much it means to each of you, and without this congregation, congregation, um, I know my life would uh, not be near as full. So, uh, all right, Sister Renee, are there any prayer requests in the uh, chat room that you're yeah. aware? Of? I was just going through. I think Samantha, I got to scroll back up, was asking for prayers here. Prayer for my cousin Samantha. Uh, Rachel asked for that. Rachel said prayer for her cousin Samantha. I get God knows what it's for. Uh, if you guys have any last minute prayer requests, put them in now. I don't. I don't see any. Uh, nope. But it, we'll check at the end also and do another another call for prayer if needed. Mm -hmm. All right then. Uh, okay, then, uh, if there's no other prayer needs, uh, then let's go ahead and pray for each other. Uh, uh, we'll take 30 seconds right now, and please, everybody, pray for all of these needs. Amen. Uh, all right, then let's um, get into the discussion part of the program. Uh, oh, wait, we have music still. Uh, so, uh, Brother Ben, uh, do you have a, a couple of uh, hymns or songs that you can play? Uh, I hope everybody liked the music we had last week. That style of music is a particularly one of my favorites. Uh, let, give me your feedback if, if you enjoyed last Sunday's songs. And Ben, can you give us a couple more today? Yes, so we're, I'm going to play a little bit more of this from the same artist as last week, and then uh, an all-time classic and one of my favorites. Never yeah, I'd like to also ask everybody to subscribe to the channel of this uh, person who has uh, provided the, these songs for us free of charge. Uh, Brother Luke, while yeah. music is playing, I, I want to announce the prayers that we got right at the last second uh, before we forget. Uh, Chris Ann asked us to pray for her. Hendricks asked prayers for his aunt, for Brother Ivan James of ex-Catholics, and so many more. I'm assuming this is to do with a salvation or growth in some way. Uh, and Heather asked for traveling mercies for her husband, who's in Minneapolis, and also for his salvation. Uh, so if we're listening to music, maybe we can lift him up in prayer for those. All right. Thank you. Okay, Brother Ben, I'll turn it over to you for the music. Okay.
Calling Luke, calling Luke. There you go. Okay, I, I had muted so many things, I forgot to mute them, unmute everything. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, because of the delay, I was still listening to it when you're telling me it's over, but I'm listening. So, okay, maybe I'll get better at that in the future. But uh, let me see, I am sending a reply to Heather. Let me see, let me put one last word in here for Heather. All right, hope everybody has fun with that comment. Um, all right, yeah, that, that to me, I've always loved bluegrass music. Um, 
you know, I didn't, I grew up here in Las Vegas, so it's not really my culture, but for, there's something about it that's always appealed to me, especially after I saw that movie, Oh Brother, Where, Where Art Thou? It's, uh, so, but uh, the, the, the words of these songs, though, are really, uh, I listened to each one before I sent them to you, Ben, uh, to make sure that it, there was no false gospel message. So the, the gospel is really pure and, and clearly stated in them. All right. Uh, I guess we're ready for the uh, discussion part of the program. So let's go to the, the first question. And uh, the first question is, uh, Exodus 4.11 says that God makes the deaf deaf and the blind blind. And Romans 9 says God makes vessels of honor, a dishonor and honor. Doesn't he have a right over the pots he makes? Is all this teaching predestination Calvinism? And secondly, if God wants everyone to be healed, why does it say in Exodus 4.11 that uh, he makes the deaf, deaf, etc.? cetera? Mm -hmm. All right, this could be a tough one. R Renee, you got a good answer for that? Yeah, I think uh, here's the thing. God is sovereign. I, I think a good example of this of God's sovereignty versus the will of man would be the story of Joseph. Now, God did not cause his brothers to falsely accuse him or make them jealous. God gave him dreams that uh, one day they would all bow before him. They got jealous. Uh, they hated him because he was his father's favorite. They uh, sold him as a slave, told his father that he was killed. Uh, and he was God's blessing was upon him. He was elevated to the uh, highest place uh, in the household of, I believe it's Potiphar, the man who was his master. Uh, then he was falsely accused of raping the man's wife because he refused sex with her. As a matter of fact, he said, how can I do this thing to my God? How can I do this wicked thing to my God? So he gets falsely accused again, thrown in prison. Yeah. God didn't do all these things to him. However, God's plan was to use Joseph, elevate him as the second most powerful man in the world to save millions of lives. He saved the nation of Israel, preserved them from uh, utter destruction because of the famine that God knew was coming. So here's God's sovereignty, but his sovereignty is being used within man's free will. And it says, you know, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant this for evil against me, but God used it for good. So I believe that based on our response to God, God has a plan. Now he can choose who he wants for what purpose. Okay, uh, John the Baptist was chosen from his mother's womb to be like Elijah, the voice crying in the wilderness. He uh, chose uh, the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be the chosen nation. He said, Jacob, I loved you, so I David, meaning that he had chosen Jacob to be the nation that the Savior would be born through. A lot of people think predestination means he chose people to be saved and lost. That's not true. It says he's not willing any should perish, draws all men to himself. Some people are blind, stiff-necked, hard of hearts. We know that. Um, now, God can use people and predestine them to be chosen for specific purposes, to serve his purpose. Like the Pharaoh, he served the purpose. Pharaoh was never going to change his mind. His heart was hardened. And after a while, it says, well, God just hardened his heart. Well, that's not fair because he could have changed his mind. God knows the end from the beginning. Pharaoh was prideful, believed himself to be a God in the flesh. He was never going to change his mind and submit to God. And God knew that. So he used what he knew for good. So what I see in scripture is that he sees what's going to happen, the end from the beginning. That's what he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Mm -hmm. Just because I know something's going to happen doesn't mean I made it happen. 
just because God knows who's going to be saved or, or re reject him doesn't mean he made that person lost or saved. It means he worked within that realm. And I believe there is free will. In the Jews. That's why it says, whosoever will come. And Jesus stood over Jerusalem and said, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathered her chicks, but you would not. Uh, so there's many places where man's free will is still in place, but God in his sovereignty, who knows the end from the beginning, chooses specific people and circumstances to manifest his sovereign will. So I, I don't, um, you know, like he didn't cause Judas to betray Jesus, but he knew he would, and he used it to save mankind. He used his betrayal. So um, I, I think people mix up this people, uh, God having vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. If you refuse God and you hate him, and you refuse to be used as a vessel of dishonor, a uh, vessel of honor for him, fine. He'll use you as a vessel of dishonor. But either way, he will get glorified through your life. So I, I just, I don't think it's God chooses every little single thing a man does. I think his sovereign will is worked through his foreknowledge. Oh, well, I'm very impressed. Uh, of course, I'm I'm always impressed, Sister. Uh, your your answers. I mean, obviously, we don't agree 100 percent of the time, but almost all the time, you're, I agree with your answer. And often, it's just it's really very profound the way you you answer a question. The uh, um, I, so I'll say Amen to everything you said first of all. And then uh, in the chat room, I see that. Uh, Several people are may, have made some very good points in the chat room about this. Also, um, I'm I'm just we we have quite a, a wealth of knowledge here. I mean, I I won't pat myself on the back, but uh, the panelists that we have on our programs and the uh, people in the chat room, it's collectively there's an awful lot of uh, Bible understanding. So that's that's very valuable to, to all of us. Uh, now, regarding this question, I guess I can repeat and emphasize a couple of points that were made. Um, first of all, uh, I think OU said, uh, OUDC said, that he, I hate Calvinism, or MG says, I hate Calvinism. And uh, amen, I, I hate Calvinism. Every, every aspect of Calvinism, I disagree with, and I even despise it. I would even say, I loathe, abhor, detest, despise, abominate Calvinism. Now you know how I feel, but uh, because uh, really all of it is uh, it uh, it turns God into a monster. It's not that Calvinism God is not the God of the Bible, in my opinion. Um, now this question uh, is particularly uh, asked about Romans nine, and uh, Romans nine is one of the most important chapters in the whole Bible. Um, but the reason it's important is because Calvinists misunderstand it and misapply it and use it uh, to um, base their, you know, their whole uh, philosophy uh, on Romans 9. Um, so on the Wednesday night Bible studies that we do, if you look through the, the older videos uh, when we were on Romans, look at the Romans chapter 9 uh, teaching and, and it, it we go over it very, very thoroughly, the whole chapter. But the important thing to understand is that Romans 9 is not talking about personal or individual salvation. First of all, it's talking about the nation of Israel versus the nation of Edom. Uh, and, and it's also talking about individuals, but not for the purpose of salvation, but uh, electing individuals for, to use for God's purpose. And God is sovereign. It means he has the right to do whatever he wants to do. Sovereignty should not be understood the way the Calvinists teach it, that God is sovereign in the respect that he actually controls everything. Because if God controls everything, that means that every, everything I'm thinking, everything I say, every gesture I make, every act I do, even if I were to go rape, murder, or plunder, God is actually controlling me, making me do all these things like a puppet master. 
So um, if that was the case, that would mean that I'm an innocent puppet and God is the evil puppet master. So I reject that entire, entirely. Uh, we do have free will. So there is a principle of foreknowledge. That means God knows the future. Um, and uh, there is a principle of predestination. But the predestination part really is, is not talking about being predestined to be saved. It's talking about predestined to be conformed. In other words, those people who uh, get saved, it's our destiny to someday be fully transformed and, and uh, become a true uh, child of God in every aspect, body, soul, and spirit, even a glorified body. Uh, so that's, that's our, pre, we're predestined for that. Uh, so those, understanding those concepts is, is important in the overall understanding. Uh, now, what about making people deaf? Uh, uh, well, I don't know if uh, God ever makes every person deaf that's deaf. Uh, I, I think that uh, a lot of things that happen that when people are born with uh, some, uh, let's say, abnormalities or uh, What's it called? When, def deformities and these things. Uh, I think it's a result of um, sin and disease coming into the world and affecting the uh, the outcome. Um, I don't think God is knitting a, a person with no arms in the womb to, to be born with no arms, but I do think that God may do that on occasion because he, his in his sovereignty he he does have the right to intervene anytime he wants and he does on occasion. So. He's, he's not controlling every single thing for every person throughout all time, but he is inserting himself when he feels the need and he has the right to interject himself and impose something to accomplish something. So it's like when Jesus said that man's not blind because of his father or his mother's sins. Uh, it, it, he's, he's blind so that for God uh, to, to serve this purpose and Jesus healed him. So it served the purpose of Jesus being able to demonstrate his his um, uh, deity, his healing power. When Ben is done, I need to answer the second part of the question. I didn't answer it. I'm sorry, I forgot it. Okay, I um, I didn't uh, hear what, what what do you say about Ben? When he's done with his answer, I need to answer the second part of the question because. Uh, well, um, Ben says he's he's, he's just going to produce the program today. Well, know. actually, actually, Luke, there's this one little tidbit I think is interesting. Oh, about okay, this. go ahead. Feel free. Go ahead, brother. Um, uh, if, again, uh, context is king. I, what you guys said is absolutely correct. Uh, but um, one of the things that I, I found was that if you read through this between uh, Exodus 3 and 4, um, Moses, God's saying, I'm going to send you. And Moses keeps on giving objections. Go, Lot, you know, the first one is in Exodus 3.11 where he says, God, uh, what, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, certainly I'll be with you. And this shall be the sign that that it is I who have sent you. And basically, so Moses gives a number of of objections, and then in verse in verse four eleven, he says, "I'm slow of speech." Reminds me of myself, a stammering uh, fool. <laughs> um, I having just having fun. Um, he's slow of speech, and it's you know he's basically making excuses. God, God, I can't, I can't do this. And God basically is telling him, you know. Uh, I'm the one that makes people talk and I'm going to make people, make people deaf. So if I'm, if I'm going to have you do something, surely I'm going to equip you to, to do the job effectively, essentially, I think is what the, the gist of that Exodus 411 is about. So I don't know. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, that's the entire point I was going to make. The, the whole point of that is not that God is claiming, hey, I'm the one that makes people deaf. I'm the, no, he's saying I control all things if I want to. So just because you think you have a stutter and can't speak publicly with my power, you can do anything. That's all he's saying. Aren't I the one in control of, of he says, then the Lord said, who's made man's mouth? I'm the one that made man's mouth. I'm the one that created him or who make it the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind. I like I'm in control of all these things. So if I send you on a mission, like Ben said, I'm going to equip you to be able to do it. So that's all this verse is saying. And I think it's wrong when we take verses out of context and put an absolute on them. Uh, for instance, the uh, uh, the Jews believed that if a person had a birth defect or was dumb or blind, 
that somebody in their generation had sinned and therefore deserved it. It's the same belief of karma in the new age or with the Hindus. They don't help poor people because they think they're working off their karma. So that's why they're not charitable. It's really horrible. Um, and so we see like Luke brought up, he said, who sinned this man or his man's parents? Well, he's born blind. How could the child have sinned? But Jesus said, neither one sinned. He's blind so that God may be glorified. So the whole point of him being blind is that God was going to have Jesus heal him and he would be glorified in that. So that was the whole point of it. We, we don't understand why things that seem bad to us can be used by God for good. We also see people that are deaf and dumb that were possessed by a devil. So we also see that the devil does this. We see the woman that was bent over and sick. He said, this woman is a child of God and she's bound by Satan. I can't lose her because it's Sabbath. So we see that the enemy also makes people sick and deformed or blind or deaf. We never know what circumstance causes it. As Luke also said, sin entered to the world and all of creation is growing, groaning. So there's going to be imperfections in the body and other such issues. So it's not up to us as human beings to say that person's blind because God did it to him. Or that person's blind because the devil's in him. Or that person's blind because their family sin. Or that person's blind for God's glory. All we need to know is that no matter what the circumstances, God can and will use all things for the good of those who love him. Uh, but this Exodus verse is clearly saying exactly what Ben said it says, that Moses is objecting. Look, I, I don't speak well publicly. I have a, a speech impediment. And he goes, hey, I'm the guy that made your mouth. Uh, so if I send you uh, to do something, I will make sure it works. So uh, that's all this verse is saying. Okay, uh, I listened carefully, but I was a little bit distracted, Renee, because of your beauty, sister. Oh my goodness! You, your your beauty is is outstanding today, and I think that what I, the difference is is it's not that you suddenly became more beautiful. Is you have new equipment, and the camera is so good, we we can actually really see clearly now. Oh, thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, let me read the. Uh, uh, the verse 12 along with it to, and, and put, you know, there, there's a saying that uh, a text uh, out of context is a pretext. So, you, you know, it's always important to read the surrounding verses. And oftentimes when you have a problem with a verse, then the answer is in the very next verse. You'd be surprised how often that happens. But I'll read 11 and 12 together and, and it'll make a little bit more sense. And the Lord said unto him, who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. So uh, the, the Lord, you, know, you can see here that, uh, hey, he's not just saying that out of the blue to, to say that he makes people deaf and dumb. He, he's, he's saying that to let uh, uh, well, Moses, no, don't worry about your stutter. Uh, I'm, I'm great, and I'll give you the right words, and you'll be perf be able to speak perfectly because I'll be helping you. Um, all right. Um, any more before we move on? All right. I guess we'll go to the next question then. All right. Question two is, how do you overcome the spirit of fear and timidity? especially if you fill your mind with God's word by reading verses about it. Yet the problem does not go away. All right. Sister Renee? Okay. I'm looking for it. Hold on. I'm looking to read it. How do you overcome the spirit of fear, and especially if you fill your mind with God's word reading verses, but the problem does not go away? Well, here's the thing. It tells us that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, patience, kindness, and that God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and sound mind. However, we see people of God failing in this all the time. We see Gideon, you know, scared to death, mighty man of valor. He's like, what, who, me? And he kept shrinking his, his army. And see, God 
sees what we don't. And fear is just a matter of when we get into, we're all human, when we don't trust God, when what we see appears greater than what we don't see. And that's why it says the just shall live by faith. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if you're in fear, what our minds are saying is that what I'm seeing is making me fearful. It's more powerful than what I can't see. And so we have to know that our God is on the throne and that no matter what happens, it can never separate us from the love of God in Christ. Now, these things aren't easy. Jesus talked about a, a lot of things the apostles and disciples would have to endure, even death. But what I believe is that if we continue to just rely on him and know that he's got it, that he gives us the strength in the moment. Like, I, I think a lot of us fear that what if this happens and I'm not strong enough, right? I don't think we need to think that way. I think that he gives us the strength in the moment when needed. That's why he told the disciples, don't worry about what you'll say when they persecute you, throw you in prison, threaten you, beat you, whatever, because the Holy Spirit's going to speak for you. He's going to give us the strength when needed. So to me, uh, fear in general is just having less faith in what's not seen and having more faith in what is seen. And so we walk by faith, not by sight. That is the difference between us and the world. We, we're supposed to trust our God. We're in his hands. And even if we're going through something, our, our faith can never be triumphant if we never go through any tribulation. If we never go through anything difficult, we can't inspire others. That's why we are told to have the faith, the peace that surpasses all understanding. Because to the world, they're like, how could that person still be at peace with all this they're going through? You've heard of people taken in prison and they still have peace and they're singing to God. Look at Paul and Silas praising the Lord in hymns, in chains, in jail. If they weren't ever put in that situation, we wouldn't be talking about it 2,000 years later, how great that peace and that faith was. So uh, I think fear is something every human being has, but we don't dwell in that. We, we look for the things that are not seen, the promises of God, rather than the evidence that we see. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, let me first respond to Brother Hendricks uh, because he, uh, he told me I better be careful. He says, are we going to have to call Mrs. Luke? I guess that's about what I said about Renee's beauty. Um, well, uh, my wife is not insecure by any means. Uh, I mean, I tell her every day uh, she is the most beautiful woman in the world to me. And I still remember the very first time my eyes beheld her. I mean, I can see her just as clear as she's in front of me now, what she looked like for the very first time. Immediately when I saw her, I was smitten at the very moment. It was, and my wife is beautiful on the inside. She is actually the most thoughtful person I've ever known. So my wife is not really insecure when I recognize someone else's beauty. But, uh, so don't worry, Hendrix. You can rat on me all you want. Uh, now, back to the question, though. Uh, there's a saying that uh, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is when you have fear, you go forward anyway. And I, I, that, uh, that's something that proved to be uh, true in my own experience uh, and when I started street preaching. Um, you know, uh, I've heard it said that the most uh, scary thing in America, if you when they take a poll, what's the most scary thing you would have to do? And it's public speaking. Um, many people are afraid to get it in front of a group of people and, and make a speech. Um, 
some people have a natural ability. Some people, uh, they have to learn and develop it and, and get, get over their fears. But uh, it's a common problem. And even though I have a, before I started free preaching, I had already given thousands, I know, t tens of thousands of speeches because my whole career was, was based upon uh, doing public speaking. So I was experienced, but at the same time, I wasn't experienced in going out publicly to a, a, a crowd that was, I, I was not invited. I'm not a guest speaker, you know, uh, and I didn't even have a captive audience, you know, they could leave anytime. And, uh, so um, it's a completely different environment and it's a subject that offends so many people, as we know. So uh, under those circumstances, it's even more intimidating and scary. So I can tell you that um, uh, I preached more than a thousand times in the street. I, I bet you there were a hundred times I preached before the fear finally was no there, no longer there. But what I discovered is that the fear would be um, uh, very, very difficult on me uh, the night before, the morning of, the, as I'm driving over to my place to preach, uh, and as I'm getting ready to preach, but the fear went away instantly as soon as I began to speak. Once the first words came out, the fear was completely gone. But of course, I'm praying the whole time, Lord, uh, you know, the, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, the devil flees from me in the name of Jesus. Greater is he who is in me than he is in the world. And um, uh, But when I began to speak, uh, and the fear was completely gone. But uh, the, it took me about preaching at least 100 times, probably over the period of a year, before uh, I didn't have the fear preceding the preaching. And so the reason the fear went away, though, gradually, is because of experience. Um, there's a saying that everything is difficult before it is easy. And uh, if you do something the first time, it may be hard and it gets easier and easier. And eventually, you've overcome your fears. Uh, so I would say it's normal to have fear. If you didn't have fear, uh, there's probably something out that's not working right. Your body is, is made uh, to have fear. It's, it's, a, it's a protection uh, to make you alert and ready. Uh, but uh, um, So don't let the fear stop you. Go into the fear and, and, and uh, confront it and, and, and get the victory over the fear. That's what courage is. Uh, as far as Bible verses to help you, as it says in the question here, um, let me see how it's phrased again. Um, um, especially if you fill your mind with God's word by reading verses about it, yet the problem does not go away. Um, well, I think that for some people, uh, reading those Bible verses might be the solution for them. But if it's not the solution for you, then, you, as I said, don't let that stop you. Go in forward anyway, and you'll find that you'll overcome the fear. All right. Anything more, uh, Renee? Yeah. You said, uh, you know, public speaking is the number one fear. It's even greater than the fear of death. So if you're at a funeral, you're better off in the casket than reading the eulogy. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to say, as far as the verses, I I do have some verses like you were given, Brother Luke, on specific situations. And it tells us that uh, we grow in grace through the milk of the word. And the more uh, word of God we have hidden in our heart, the more they can be brought up when we need them. Um, fear is, is lack of trust. And we all have it. It's the fear that what is not seen is not as great as what we see, that the evidence of what's going on seems worse than uh, the solution, which we can't see. So uh, the, the only thing we can do sometimes, and these things are there to test our faith, to refine us as gold tried by fire. See, the reason we go through these things is to strengthen us so that we can strengthen the brethren. So uh, it's okay, like Luke said, that you have fear, feel the fear and do it anyway. Move forward and do what God says to do. Occupy till he comes. It's a matter of trusting. 
trusting him that ultimately it is in his hands. Your life is hidden in Christ and he's going to use it the way he sees fit. So uh, it's hard to do. It's hard to let go. Uh, that's why religion appeals to so many people, because religion is man controlling, man trying to do things to be right with God. It's very difficult to throw our hands in the air and say, we have nothing. Uh, so we're trusting and relying on our God. Our soul is in his hands. And that's a difficult thing to do. And it's also difficult to do in everyday situations. But if we didn't go through anything, we couldn't be strengthened. Our faith could not get stronger. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Renee, I, I think that there's probably some people um, listening who are not uh, aware of your uh, experience as an actress. Uh, but did you ever experience stage fright, uh, that kind of fear in your acting career? Oh, yes, of course. You know, especially when I had to do scenes really close up to the camera, because it's very intimidating. Because people don't realize this, but the actor you're doing a scene with is not actually there. It's You're talking to a point on the camera, and the script supervisor behind you is reading the lines like this. And then he said, hello. And so you've got to draw up all this emotion and speak to a camera with there's no actor in front of you. So you feel very insecure. I remember getting my, my throat would get dry. I'd sweat. Oh yeah. You have that all the time. And you still, once you get it done, you're shaking. You're still trembling after it's finished because of the adrenaline. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's scary. Okay. All right. Thank you. Brother Daniel's here. Hi, brother. Hey, Daniel. We were just praying for you. Hey, Brother Luke. How's it going? Did you hear my question, brother? How's it, how's it going? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear. My kids are being loud. I can't. <laughs> oh, Hush. All right. Well, do, do, uh, have you been paying attention? I just, no, sir, I just got on here. Oh, okay. Daniel's a good one for the fear. Yeah. All right. Well, let me read the question. And and uh, but, but before I read the question, would you like to give a greeting to the congregation? Yeah, just saying hey, hey to everybody. That's fine. <laughs> hey. All right, then. Okay, the question is... Um, how do you overcome the spirit of fear and timidity, especially if you fill your mind with God's word by reading verses about it, yet the problem does not go away? Um, that's, that's a good question, but uh, I, I guess you would have to I would have to have a circumstance where that happened to be able to explain it. And I can't really think of one in my own life. Um, so I guess I don't really know how to answer that question, except from just stay in the word and then, you know, just trust the Lord more in that circumstance until you, uh, until you have no more fear of it. I mean, I, it's kind of a broad question. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, you say you haven't had to deal with this problem personally very much. Uh, that's uh, uh, interesting. Um, most people have a lot of stories about, you know, things that they've done that they, you know, were fearful things. Not not necessarily fearful, like afraid of violence coming against them, but just like making this public speech is a very common thing that people are afraid to do. I got you. Well, it, I guess maybe one one thing I might be able to say is things regarding my health, you know, the, just the uncertainty there. Like, you know, I don't know. Obviously, I want to be able to be around for my kids, but I don't know if it's not the Lord's will for, you know, me to die early. You know, so I, I mean, but at the same time, hand it's like well i know he's in charge it's up to him you know but you know i guess i think about 
what what will who will teach my kids and things like that but that's not really like a fear necessarily it's just you know i don't there's just a lot of unknowns there like on one hand i know the lord you know i I believe the lord would protect my family and provide for them but i don't know how he would you know maybe there's a lot of what ifs on all that scenario but um so i I guess you could kind of say in in that there's a fear just because the fear of the unknown there like what would happen to my kids you know will they you know would they hear the gospel and and trust it or would they get angry with god if something happened to me i mean there's there's some of that there i guess so uh, but i even talk to my kids about that now like you know that's a that's a very well, real possibility and for them not to be angry with the lord if the lord took me for some reason so you know in that circumstance i'm still teaching my kids to trust the lord but you know i mean i guess that's that's the probably the most real scenario that i can think of in my own life Interesting. I've, I've, I've confessed to people in the congregation uh, numerous times, and maybe you're tired of hearing about it, but I, I've always struggled with worry. And worry is uh, a kind of a component of fear, I think, when you, you're afraid something's not going to work out or it's going to go. I, I worry for my family and friends a lot. Uh, I'm almost afraid something's going to happen to them. And, uh, so, but um, that's not something we've... Uh, been relating to this question so much uh but uh all right does anybody want to say anything more about this one before we go to the next question all right we'll go to the next one question three is uh, uh anti-hebrew roots versus hyper anti-hebrew roots <clears throat> some christians try to combat the hebrew roots by what I call another extreme, by saying that Yahweh, Jehovah, and Yeshua are not actually God's name, but uh, such as the name Yahweh is all a big conspiracy. Uh, Some even go as far as to say that those names are actually the names of demons. I totally disagree with that view. What do you think? Are those names a conspiracy, or is this just hyper anti-Hebrew roots? Um, all right, brother uh, Daniel, would you go first on this one? Yeah, I, I don't think they're, uh, you know, names of demons <coughs> or anything like that. I mean, <coughs> I believe you know they're just names of God in Hebrew, just like. You know, Jesus is our our version in in English, and you know, if we were Spanish, we'd be calling him Jesucristo. You know, I think some people take that the sacred name thing way too far to create a whole new religion, basically of, hey, I'm the one that says God's name right, so I'm the one that's blessed and all this kind of stuff, but. You know, in the Bible itself, it gives the name Jehovah, Jah, you know, and then the Hebrew derivatives of that would be Yahweh um, and then Yeshua for Jesus. So I have no problem with people using that those words, but it is kind of odd to me for them to use it if they're not actually Hebrew. So, you know, the Hebrew roots movement is a little bit odd in that respect like people think they're being more spiritual because they're being like jews or hebrews when that has nothing to do with spirituality okay thank you that's interesting uh sister renee what's your answer yeah uh this whole thing has gotten silly to me uh, i've heard that that some of the people put the uh, the yud hey vav hey in and that that is actually a demonic name or something. I, I don't know about all that, but this is what I do know, okay? 
Jesus's name is revealed in scripture in Koine Greek. It's Iesus. They didn't have a J. So Jesus, that's the name we're told is above all names. And I'm not Hebrew, so I don't call him Yahshua or Yeshua. I don't know why people need to start speaking Hebrew uh, if that's not what they speak. I think there's a lot of pride in that. That whole Hebrew roots movement is legalistic and prideful. Sorry. Um, the Bible, when it does want us to pronounce something in Hebrew or needs us to know the Hebrew name, it will say, but in the Hebrew tongue, it is blah, blah, blah. It'll tell you, but in the Hebrew tongue. So if it's important that we understand the word or speak it in Hebrew, it will tell you in the Hebrew tongue. Here it is. Now, Jesus told us to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. So that's what I do. I've never known the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Yahweh, Jehovah, any of those uh, superficial names. Uh, I've always known him as my father, and that's how I call out to him. So to keep from doing anything uh, that not just could be offensive to God, but would be impersonal, I just call him my father, and I call Jesus Jesus because that's the name he was given to us in Greek. He didn't give us this Hebrew name in the New Testament. They didn't put Yahshua. They put Jesus, Christo. So uh, Jesus Christ is the name I use. It's the name above all names. It's the one we're told. Uh, so I don't get involved in this Hebrew root stuff. I, I can't say I'll take it as far as to say yud heh vav -Hey is demonic. Uh, some people have claimed that Yahweh is a Canaanite God. Okay, that's possible because there was no vowels. Hebrew has no vowels, so we can't know how it was actually supposed to be pronounced in Hebrew. And because I'm not Hebrew and I don't live in, you know, 2000 BC, I, I don't use that name. Uh, I believe the uh, Old Testament we have puts capital L-O-R-D because his name was supposed to be sacred or something. Uh, and unfortunately, they were calling him uh the word Baal, which means generic Lord or master. And that was how they started worshiping a false God. So I think the best way to do it is how Jesus told us. Our father who's in heaven in the name of Jesus Christ. It's very simple. It's good enough for me. It's been good enough for Paul. I, I think that's the way we should go. I, I don't understand all this. See, in witchcraft, you have to pronounce words a certain way to summon forth entities and stuff. It's like a magical thinking, and I don't like to go there. Uh, the, the name Jesus isn't a magic name. It's the person, Jesus Christ, the spirit that has the power. It's not how we pronounce it, but the right Jesus. We're warned of another Jesus, the right Jesus, the son of the living God who came and died for us, lived a perfect life, uh, offered his blood and mercy seat of him, was buried and rose again on the third day and gave us eternal life. That is the Jesus, uh, and that's the only name that I use. Okay, thank you. Um, I've just heard, let's say, very generally about these claims in the question. Um, I've never taken the time to really delve into it and study for example, if the real meaning of some of these names are either pagan or, uh, you know, satanic or something like that. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at it. I, I just didn't bother to take the time. It's something I'm not concerned about. I, I don't do it. Uh, if, I, if I come across someone that does use another name, uh, I'd have to discuss it with them to figure out why they're doing it. But uh, to me, uh, whatever language a person speaks, um, God is not bilingual, he's omnilingual. <laughs> he speaks every language. He, he even speaks my uh, secret language, um, um, ver my version of Pig Latin. So uh, every language, whatever their Jesus's name is in that language, I don't believe God's gonna be dogmatic and say, no, you've got to say it in English. Uh, <laughs> I, I think people take these kinds of things way, way too far. Um, but for me, 
the name Jesus is very important um, because he says that the Bible says we're saved by believing in his name. It says there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Uh, it says every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we're going to confess that his name, Jesus Christ. Uh, but if they're uh, Spanish and they call him uh, Jesus, or you know, another version of it, I, I don't think God's going to hold that against them. He was happy that they recognize him. As long as they understand that he's God, he died on the cross for their sins, he's raised from the dead. This is the, the Jesus or Jesus or whatever version of it you're saying. This is the one you're referring to. That's, that's what's important to understand the identity of him, who he is. Um, all right. Anyone want to say more about this one? Yeah, I, I do want to say anytime somebody refuses to say the name Jesus Christ or will say anything other than Jesus Christ, it just makes me weird. I'm like, why is the name of Jesus Christ not good enough for you when it's the name given to us clearly in Scripture? I, I don't understand this aversion to the name of Jesus. Uh, it's almost like they're ashamed of it and they'd rather use a Hebrew word. Uh, some of them are prideful and think that they are, they really know God because they know how to pronounce it. I think Dan Daniel was saying something like that. So I, I, I don't like it all. I, I, it feels very impersonal, fake and legalistic and prideful to me. Jesus is the name above all names and it should be good enough. So if somebody is refusing to say that name, I'd, I'd start to wonder about them. Amen. All right, I'll go to the next question. Um, question number four is, God is awesome beyond our imagination. Scientists, that is astrophysicists, NASA, astronomers, etc., know there are lots of other planets even in our own galaxy, let alone the universe, such as uh, God created them. Some of them are even better than Earth in their own way but just don't have a life on them, such as they're bigger, have better temperatures, have a better sea to land ratio. Uh, I have two questions. This question would appeal to most to Renee because she and Jim Jim are more into astronomy. So I have two questions, one for Renee or those who are not flat earth and one for the others. One, do you believe there is life on other planets? And two, uh, to the saints such as Luke, Matthias, and others who are flat earthers, how do you reconcile flat earth with even the planets we see in the sky like Mars, Venus? What do you believe these planets actually are? Okay, we'll start with Sister Renee. Okay, uh, well, yeah, Jim Jim and I do have a telescope and we go, we look and we, we look at the ring Saturn, we look at Mars, we can see Jupiter. They're they're balls. I mean, they're they're round. I am not a flat earther. Uh, I don't believe the Bible. Uh, I, I think you can interpret it to say that, but I also think you can interpret it to be a sphere. I have no problem with it. Um, there's other scientific issues I have with flat Earth that can't be answered. I have looked into it. I respect those uh, that have that position. Many of my friends do. I do not. Uh, however, uh, I, I think the heavens declare the glory of God and the planets are just um, the heavens. You know, um, I think it, it all it says the angels jumped up and down for joy when he created this. So I think all of it declares God's glory. I think they're simple planets. And no, I do not believe there's alien life on Earth uh, or other planets because of this. When we fell, the whole dimension fell. The whole creation fell. So there are uh, humanoid or intelligent life on other planets. They fell also. And that would mean they would need a savior. And did Jesus die for them? So I don't believe that. I think the earth is uh, God's footstool. It is his focus. It is below heaven in another dimension. I think heaven is right there. We just can't see it. It's a, a dimension. I think we used to be able to see it. Adam used to be able to see it, but the dimension was closed. I do believe that fallen angels and all the 
things you see in the second heaven, the prince of the power of the air, it's all satanic, the UFOs and all that. They are spiritual. They evangelize us. They act like a demon. They walk like a demon. They talk like a demon. They are demonic entities. Uh, and those things are not intergalactic, but interdimensional. Now, could they have gone to Mars and set up? I don't know. These fallen angels could have done all that. They could have had civilization. I don't know what happened before man got here. It's very possible. But in, in this dimension, I do not believe in our universe, there's other intelligent life in our fallen dimension because all of creation fell. The whole uh, universe fell uh, when Adam fell. That's why uh, we have the, this atrophy. Everything is degrading and it's crying out. Uh, for perfection again. So no, I do not believe there are entities on other planets that are in our dimension. If there's anything there, it would be spiritual entities, fallen angels, stuff like that. I think anything out there is all spiritual and not just flesh and bone. But I will say they can manifest physically. People forget that angels sat down and ate with Abraham. They, these are physical. They have bodies. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I think people just have a wrong understanding of what these spirit things are. They can manifest physically, but, uh, no, I think it all glorifies God. All right. Thank you. All right, brother Daniel, what do you say? Well, first of all, the, the as far as these other planets being terra firma, that's not, even NASA can't give us anything like that except in fake pictures or paintings. So when you actually look at these things up in the sky, the planets are simply just wandering stars. They're all lights. So it's very interesting. If you do have a, a, a way to zoom in on the stars and everything, they're really fantastic and amazing. But they're definitely not what the, we're told they are. And you could just see that by you know what you can observe versus what we're we're shown in 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 paintings artist conceptions but um but yeah there's no there's no other life anywhere else um but i you know in my cosmology view everything is a lot smaller um and closer so you know i take it when when the bible says that the stars fall to the earth like figs falling you know from a fig tree you know you don't have a fig that's five or 15 quadrillion times the size of the ground that it falls on so it's you know it's a lot simpler and just the stars being a lot closer and smaller they're not so many trillions of light years away and all of that so um it's you know it's actually a lot simpler explanation in my opinion but yeah there's no light there are beings but they're demons that's why you know they're they're trying to prep the world for this fake alien invasion and all of this kind of stuff so you know it's just kind of funny every time you know just about once a week you, you can see nasa's trying to stay relevant by putting out something about an asteroid fly by or something like that and it's like when you when you understand what the, the bible says it's like uh you know it's almost comical you can go on some of the nasa videos the live feeds that they put and it's it's kind of funny because they're actually getting trolled really bad about you know faking so many different things and so it's like if it was all real, they would never have to fake anything. And they've already been caught in so many things that are just lies and flat out fakes. It's, it's become comical. But anyway, that's, that's my explanation. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, uh, the questioner is correct that, uh, you know, I, I am one of those who hold to the, the flat stationary earth now. But I didn't come to that conclusion easily. I fought it and resisted it as long as I possibly could. Um, uh, I had so many objections. Uh, they're the obvious ones. And then the more you look at it and, and listen and try to 
uh, try to find out for sure, uh, you, you, more questions come up and more problems. But uh, so I, in the beginning, I was thinking this is absolutely absurd to think it's flat and stationary. Uh, I had so many issues, it was just going to be impossible to ever change my mind. But because I persisted in uh, listening and listening and push more and more, I found that there, there were, I found that for me, there were um, good answers that, that resolved pretty much all my all my uh, concerns and questions. So I was forced to change my, my mind. Um, but I, I ended up, uh, by watching all those videos, uh, making a, a playlist titled um, Flat Earth, Could It Be True? Uh, that playlist is still one of my lost playlists right now. It's not uploaded on my new channel. Maybe eventually we'll be able to get it back up. But I have, I think, about 120 videos on the playlist. The reason I'm bringing it up is because, as I said, there are so many problems, uh, objections. And these are intelligent, legitimate objections to a flat, stationary Earth. It's, it's, it's so many problems that to try to really make any kind of presentation in a, in a short time is, is it's impossible. That's why you'd have to start really watching videos to the extent that I did. And anybody who's changed their mind has probably spent a year or two uh, really delving into it before that they were convinced. Uh, but to me, the, uh, the number one thing, uh, like what I like to say is, um, in, in pretty much all the uh, questions we have about theology in the Bible, uh, I, I have a phrase, that settles it. In other words, is there anything that is that is, I could say this one single thing is enough for me to, to say that that settles the my answers based upon that alone? And I found that uh, uh, as far as the, the ball earth or the flat earth, uh, what settles it for me is that we can see things that are so far away, um, not only with the, the naked eye, but with uh, you know telescopes um, across the land that we should not be able to see if the earth is size and shape that it's supposed to be, that, that these objects would be well behind the curvature of the earth. And because we can see things that are so far away, it, it, to me that disproves the, the curvature of the earth. Uh, and the stationary, uh, or moving Earth, what this proves is that we're supposed to be spinning, uh, rotating at a thousand miles an hour at the equator. I mean, imagine how fast, if you're moving a thousand miles an hour, I mean, uh, there's no way that we, we wouldn't feel that and, and, and things would not be disrupted and disturbed if you're moving that fast. Uh, and then the, the Earth is supposed to be going through the solar system at, I think, 66,000 uh, miles per hour. And imagine how fast that is. Why is it at that kind of a speed? Isn't it just... It's actually, it's actually 66,600 miles per hour around the sun. Yeah, yeah that's a coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a, that's a number that should always get our attention. But at, at that speed... Um, it seems to me that anything would be disintegrated based upon if you've watched any movies about, you know, comets, how they're burning up as they're, they're not going, you know, that fast and they burn up. So the earth would be burned up if it was actually traveling that fast. And then uh, our solar system moving through throughout the universe is, it goes, I think about a half a million miles an hour. I don't remember all these numbers exactly, but imagine how fast that is uh, if, if, if that speed things would be destroyed. We wouldn't exist. So to me, those things prove that we cannot be moving. We have to be stationary. Um, but there's so much more to it. And uh, uh, that now getting back to these questions here, though. Uh, so I would say that, no, there's no life on other planets because I don't see planets the way I used to. I, I, I think that they are, as I said, they're lights in the firmament. Uh, and uh, uh, but I would, I'm going to take the other position for a second just to tell you what I would have answered in the past before I changed my mind. Uh, because I'd like everybody to consider this if you, if you want to hold, uh, stay in, in the, uh, the ball um, earth position. Um, if, if it's true that we have um, millions and billions and even trillions of planets and stars and it, it, it were that vast, it seems like uh, the odds... Of, uh, of there being a life in other channels, the, the odds would be great that, come on, we surely can't be the only one. 
But when you study what's required for uh, life to exist on Earth, uh, it's very fragile. Uh, the, the distance from the sun, the tectonic plates, the gravitational pull, uh, if it would, these things were modified even a tiny little bit, it would be impossible for us to, to, to live and exist. And so for the odds of all those things happening perfectly so that we, that proves it's designed and it's um, uh, and, uh, that the chances of that happening throughout the whole universe is really uh, odds much, much more against it being the case. Uh, uh, but let's suppose that if you were going to say that, well, there's got to be life on other planets, wouldn't there be one planet that was the first to have life? I mean, let's say that there's a hundred planets that have life. One of them had to be the first, and then there was a second and the third and so on. Well, what, if you want to believe that life should exist on other planets, you could, well, some people argue that's the way it's going to be. We're going to explore the universe in eternity and in our glorified bodies. Maybe we'll be able to materialize in another world. And uh, if that's the case, uh, there's logical to me that, well, why isn't Earth the first? We could very easily be the very first place where God makes life, and then if there's got if the odds are there's going to be more, then then uh, obviously then you can have the second and the third. But uh, so that's how I would. Uh, and gosh, my hand just went. In. Oh, look at that! I'm cramping up. I need to drink more water. Um, and let me see if there's any more to the question I missed. Uh, uh, Flatters, how do you work as a flatter one? Okay, I think we've covered, I covered it all between Daniel and my answer. I would, I would agree with the points that Daniel made. All right, um, any, you want to say anything more, Daniel or Renee? Yeah, I just was going to mention those different speeds. Uh, you know, if you, when you actually start looking at everything, the number 666 comes up a whole lot. And it's, I don't think it's a coincidence, like the the tilt of the earth supposedly on its axis is 23.4, well, the opposite of that is 66.6. The amount of curvature in a mile is 0.666 feet, which is almost eight inches, you know, or it's eight inches roughly, you know, 66,600 miles per hour around the sun. There's just so many things like that. It's it's not a coincidence, but you know, this uh, uh, the solar system moving 500,000 miles an hour through the Milky Way, but then the Milky Way is also moving two million miles. But with all of that, those movements, we've had the same stars for 5,000 years. The sun and the moon. Just like the Bible says in Psalm 19, that the sun's just moving on a circuit. A circuit goes from one place and ends up where it started. That's not the heliocentric model by any means. At the very least, you would have to say the Earth is a geocentric book. You know, whether it's, you know, a flat plane or not, you could debate that, but it's definitely geocentric. But that's all I wanted to add to that. And I do have a, a pretty much of a, a proof of uh, that the sun is moving around the earth and not the earth moving around the sun. We could talk about that another day or whatever. Those numbers, Daniel, those numbers actually um, line up with the Great Pyramid, like the distance from the sun to the earth and all that. The same numbers are like, it's a big study, but... Well, well, they keep they keep changing those numbers though. Mm. They're constantly changing those numbers. Like when Newton first came up with that, he had four million miles to the sun, and then now it's up to ninety three. But here's one you know one interesting point: if you actually triangulate the distance to the sun, which we can do, knowing the distance between the cities and the angle of the sun during the times of the day. The, the sun on average is roughly about 3,000 miles high, which, you know, all the proportions work. It's just it, the sun is a lot smaller and a lot closer, but the math still works on both models. But the um, when you triangulate it 
and even amount, uh, even accounting for the 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 most extreme curvature that you can put in there from one city on like one half of the hemisphere and, and then another on the on the other half accounting for that curvature you still only can get about 1.8 million miles maximum so my question is to nasa where's the other 90 million because math never lies like you know you can manipulate math true but but when you work math problems they always come out the same so they're they just came out about 90 million miles short <laughs> so it's 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 kind of funny okay oh boy can't get rid of this cramp in my hand my fingers are all cramping up really bad but uh heather says can i be completely honest with you all i hope you will sister uh, i don't care what shape this earth is uh, in fact i don't even plan on looking in my rear view so to speak then jesus catches us up I didn't follow the last sentence. I maybe I, I just I don't know the point. But as far as uh, not caring, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. God's God, one way or the other, doesn't matter. But uh, um, I, I do think though that if the flat stationary Earth is correct, uh, that uh, it more clearly proves that uh, this is designed uh, because we have a. Yeah, just like if you're going to design uh, some place for someone to live, you make it flat and then you put a roof over it. And and uh, you, if that is the case, then no one could argue that it was chance that it just happened to, you know, uh, explode and become a, a flat plane with a covered dome. Uh, it's it would be more uh, supportive of, of, of design. Um, uh, right. Yeah, that is that is one point that I've run across with most of the evolutionists that I've talked to about it which that's really the only people I even talk about that issue because it's like for me I, I've learned it and I've moved on to something else but it's interesting that everyone that I've talked to evolutionists said if the earth were actually flat then they know that there was there would be a god but they know that that's not true because NASA and all all of that so mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I'd also add, Heather, that uh, um, normally uh, you won't hear Daniel or me or, or Ben or, 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 or Renee for that matter. We, we don't bring this subject up. This is a question that came in. And what we've uh, decided to do is take all questions. And so if someone asks a question about this, then, then we're kind of compelled. We have to address the subject. But it's not something we bring up because we think this is so important. we got to talk about it every day. But it's also not a, sub, a, a subject that we, we're not going to avoid, you know. All right. Any more? Shall we move on? All right. The next question is... Uh, All right, to say something like people who don't believe what I do are ignorant or too afraid to face the truth, isn't this kind of violating grace in non-essentials? Although we can define ignorant as not to, to, to know something, isn't this still indirectly name calling? Uh, even if we don't take it as an insult, uh, shouldn't we walk in love by considering the more tender people who do take uh, any stronger word as an insult? Uh, because we could use the same logic to say that it's okay, for example, to call someone a bum, because bum just means being unemployed due to laziness, or a fool. A fool can also mean just not to know because there's a gentler word used for fool uh, in the Bible, and also a harsher form of the same word. Uh, all right, Sister Renee. I'm not really sure what the question is. Is it to say something like people who don't believe or are ignorant or too big? Okay. So, well, here's the thing. Words do have meaning, but you can use a word in an offensive way. Like, for instance, if I don't understand physics, I am ignorant of physics. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm an ignorant person, but you could disagree with me on something and say, you're so ignorant. And that is offensive. So it just depends on how 
words are being used. And I, I think overall what I can see here is it's the intent of our words. Jesus said, it's not what you put in your mouth that defiles you, but what comes out of your mouth because it comes from the heart. And so I think it's um, our intent. Do we intend to ridicule, slander, belittle, hurt, um, or are we just making a statement of fact? Uh, we have to be careful because in the Bible it says to stay away from even the appearance of evil. Even you could be innocent of something, but just stay away from the appearance of it. Why? We are ambassadors for Christ. And you can see the wicked behavior done by people proclaiming to be Christian or even a leader of a church that have damaged people irreparably and kept them from coming to the Lord or gave them resentment. They Most people will tell you they don't go to church because of something somebody did, some hypocrite, some self-righteousness, something done to them by a person that proclaimed to be Christian. So it's the way we use words is the intent of our heart when we use them. And when Jesus said, don't, you know, you're in danger of hellfire for calling him fool. All he's saying is the, the, the littlest thing we will be responsible for. We need a savior. We think we're good. We're not. That's what he was telling the Israelites. You, you're not, you don't keep the law. You think you're going to have life through the law and you're not. It's only showing you how you need a savior. So, um, as Christians, words matter, but the intent of those words matter more. Uh, and I think it, it's clear. We could say something that on, if you typed it up, would not be offensive at all. But if we put our little spin and our intent and the tone of our voice, it could be very hurtful to someone. So I think it all matters about why we're saying it and the intent of it. And as Christians, we're supposed to not even give the appearance of evil because it hurts the name of Jesus. Hmm. Amen. Thank you. All right, brother Daniel, what do you say? Yeah, it's kind of a thing in our society that to use the word ignorant is almost an insult, but it was in the scriptures a lot. You know, Paul didn't want the brethren to be ignorant about certain things. That just means they simply don't know certain things. So I think that's pretty normal in a lot of cases. There's a lot of things that I'm ignorant about, you know, but there's also things that I only know little things about. But because I know a little bit about a lot of things, people might think I'm smart, <laughs> but I'm not. But anyhow, um, you know, but just stating a fact that if somebody is ignorant about something, people don't need to take that as an insult. It's just because they haven't, you know, they haven't had the the opportunity or uh, maybe they just haven't heard that particular topic or, you know, ha haven't studied it out or anything like that. So, I mean, I, I'm there's quite a few things that I'm really ignorant on, but, you know, I don't take that as an insult. So I guess it just comes down to the person, you know, but just stating a fact, if somebody doesn't know certain things, you can say that they're ignorant of it. That's not an insult. That's just the truth. Oh, amen. Um, on one hand, uh, not only I think is it, uh, wise in general to adopt this policy, but here at CES, um, we've uh, made it part of our um, um, protocols, uh, and that is um, uh, charity, uh, unity, liberty. Gently, as lovingly as we can. We go out of our way to disagree as politely as we can. Uh, trying to avoid, if at all possible, uh, you know, hurting feelings and, and, and getting in the flesh, especially. Um, we don't always succeed, but um, it should be something we're striving for. Uh, but it is definitions of these words. A person should not be offended. As Daniel says he's not offended if something 
calls and says he's ignorant because he is. And, and matter of fact, uh, every person listening to me now is you're really all very quite ignorant. And uh, so I certainly am very ignorant. Um, Einstein was ignorant. You know, a lot of people say he was the smartest man in the world. Uh, but um, he's the one that said, uh, man does not even know 1% of nothing. Uh, so that means that uh, what we don't know is, is much greater than what we do know about everything. And that means if you don't know something, you're ignorant. There's things you don't know is that's what ignorance is. And even if you take the time to become an expert in one particular field, uh, and your expertise, you might be just scratching the surface of the, the, the knowledge that there really is eventually that you will um, attain uh, as you study it even further. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, we shouldn't be offended by it uh, if we understand it. Uh, and as Renee said, it's maybe not only uh, how you're saying it, but it's the tone, even the tone can make a difference. And a lot of times when we're texting, um, the disadvantage of that is that people can take things wrong because you don't have the benefit of hearing the voice and seeing the hearing the inflection. You don't get to see the facial expressions and see if it's, you know, uh, your, your face says a lot in communicating. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's very common for people to get offended reading a text when there was no intention of it at all by the person that wrote the text. Uh, I think we, we should give each other a lot more grace uh, in all these things, but I hope we can all just really go out of our way to try to uh, um, be uh, proactive. In, in other words, let's try to avoid any any chance that we're going to offend people uh, if, if we know that it could be offensive. Um, all right. Uh, anybody want to say more about uh, ignorance? <laughs> back you up on the uh, showing people grace because I have seen comments just get out of control because I'm thinking oh no he didn't mean it like that and then they just so quick to jump to being offended you know I think we should always especially in texting we should clarify uh, what's being said not jump to a conclusion that's personal and offensive uh, we we tend as Christians to get in our flesh real fast we get offended very quickly and uh, like Brother Luke's friend said, dead men don't get offended. If you're dead, uh, you, you shouldn't let your flesh win on that. You know, um, we should be slower to be offended, not just slow to offend, but slow to be offended as well. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm glad you, I'm glad you remembered what I said. Uh, Brother uh, Jim Weber, Bible Jim, has told that to me one time when I was all worked up about something, and he looked at me and said, "Brother, dead men cannot get offended." <laughs> it really put me in my place, Brother Daniel. I was just going to say I, I like something my father-in-law, Brother Eddie, says a lot. He says we just need to be thick-skinned and soft-hearted. Uh, that's, skin, that's of a skin of a rhino and the heart of a poet. Yeah, it's beautiful. What did you say, Renee? Skin of a rhino, heart of a poet, what Daniel was saying. Yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm trying. But it, it, you know, I think on one hand, the Holy Spirit is trying to make us grow and understand these things and changes. But but part of it, uh, you know, I, I think there is personal effort that's also uh, contributes to this. Or are we actually making an effort to to, to grow and mature? Uh, and uh, the spirit will transform us, but we we can either embrace it and and uh, allow the spirit to change us, or we can resist it and you know stay in the flesh. Uh, so I hope we'll all try to uh, you know do our part. You know, I I do think in a way that there, this idea of um, What's the word the Calvinists use? Uh, they're one mono, 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 what's it called mono. What is that word the Calvinists use? Mono something, mono or does anybody not yeah. familiar with those words? You're not familiar with that word mono uh, or uh, the idea is that um, it's entirely God or if there is a cooperation between man and God. And uh, I think okay, God does his part. He gives us grace. Uh, we do our part. Uh, that's faith. 
And uh, so I, I think that it's, uh, we both have our part. And then the, but the Calvinist says that, no, it's an entirely God. It's one, uh, but I, I do think that we do have a responsibility and, and particularly when it comes to uh, growing and, and being fruitful that we, we need to recognize that, Hey, I, I want to grow and mature. So I'm going to study, I'm going to pray. I'm going to try to listen to the spirit. I'm going to have fellowship and, and, and listen to the brethren. And, uh, if you do make an effort, then you're more likely to, uh, you know, mature than someone who's not even trying. I wish I could remember that word. Yeah, it, the birth. The birth was easy because God did it. But once we're born, it's up to us to, to grow up. Are you mm -hmm. monogistic? Wait, yeah, monogist, monogist, monogism is what it's called. But I can't remember the monogism or synergism. Synergism. it's not biogism. Synergistic. What yeah, synergism. Yeah. Thank you, sister. It's, it's monergism and synergism. Synergism means two things are working together. Monergism means it's only one that's doing it. So, uh, but whether you're monergist or synergist, that's, uh, you know, that's debatable. But uh, I do think that we, we do have a responsibility to make an effort in, in, in these things. Uh, I don't know why that came up. I don't remember what the question was. <laughs> uh, all right. I guess it's time now to start finishing up. Uh, Brother Daniel, we had a couple of uh, songs at the beginning that uh, Ben was able to play. Uh, did you want to do a song? Are you able to do a song as we finish up? Mm -hmm. You still there, brother? I think hmm. Dan got the kids. It might be hard on him. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Since I don't know if he's uh, going to get that fixed, let's not count on that. And let's, uh, Renee, uh, if you can give a gospel message, uh, I'll try to come up with an exhortation. Okay. Um, so uh, first, why don't you uh, give a, well, let's see if Ben would like to give any uh, final thoughts. And ben, have you been paying attention? I've been very, been, very, been paying very close attention. A lot, of, a lot of good questions, a lot of good answers. Um, and it was a really great service. So. All right. Thank you. All right, then, uh, Sister, uh, why don't you give us uh, any uh, summary remarks uh, on the, the time together today and then uh, your gospel message? Yeah, I always like uh, questions that include uh, actual verses because it's always good to go back and then we can see the context and see how easily things are misrepresented out of context. And then that was important today with the Exodus question. Uh, in addition, I, I like questions that deal with spiritual maturity and the responsibility of us as Christians. You know, we're not legalistic and don't do this. And if you don't do that, and we should know by the prompting of the spirit, what is done from kindness, love, and selflessness. We don't need a list. We don't need laws. We have the spirit of Christ within us. And we know when we're being less than gracious to people. Uh, and, uh, so I, I like the questions about our spiritual maturity. Now I, I had done a video last week on what do you need to believe to know you're saved? Because the gospel that's given clearly as the one that saved us is laid out in first Corinthians 15, one through four. It's right behind me on the wall there. And it says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures that he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now there's a lot according to the scriptures. He was promised to come and bear the sins of the world as the son of God. He was God manifest in the flesh. He came and fulfilled God's perfect law for man as man. See, he had to be God because he was born of a virgin. His father was God. And so he did not inherit Adam's sin nature. Because of Adam, all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous, no, not one. So Jesus came as the second Adam, God manifest in the flesh. Because man had to pay for the sins of man. 
and there was no one spotless enough or sinless enough to be a proper sacrifice for mankind. But God in the flesh, who lived a sinless, perfect life, became the Lamb of God without spot or blemish and paid for the sins of the world. Now, the gospel message claims to be believed by many, including Catholics. If you ask them that Jesus died for their sins, oh, yeah. But what does that mean? In Hebrews, it tells us that he by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on that. We've been reconciled to God through Jesus, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews also tells us that he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So dying for our sins has been chopped up to mean many things except what it really means is that if all your sins have been paid for by christ you will not come into condemnation because he already paid your sin debt now a lot of people can't get that they can't believe that what he did gave them eternal life because they want to think that living right qualifies them or makes them more worthy of being saved and that's why they'll say well that's not right or you could just do whatever you want. They don't understand. They can't get it. But once you put your trust in Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Now, then the process of you growing and maturing as a Christian begins and serving your purpose for the Lord. Now, if you want to be a disobedient child, you will be a vessel of dishonor, but God will use you for his glory either way. We should all strive to be a vessel of honor for him. But no matter what, none of what you do saves you, helps you be saved, or keeps you saved. It's Jesus's redemptive work on the cross that gave you eternal life. So you either trust that he obtained eternal redemption for you, or you do not. And if you don't believe you have eternal life and can't come into condemnation, then you don't believe the gospel. That is the gospel message, that you know you have eternal life based on the work of Christ, because our Savior did not fail at saving us. You either trust him or you don't. And I, and I hope you do. Sadly, many people confuse discipleship and service and purpose with what saves us and although all of us are indebted to god we could never repay him for what he's given us we are not our own anymore we belong to god uh there's nothing we can do to earn it or or be worthy of it if it be of grace it's no no more of works otherwise grace is no more grace that's why salvation is for him that worketh not but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So if you simply trust what Christ did for you, God counts that faith as righteousness. And you gotta be perfect for heaven. And you only become perfect if God perfects you by imputing his righteousness on you because you trusted Christ. Just as Jesus had our sin imputed on him. He didn't do sin to become our sin. And we don't do righteousness to become the righteousness of God. It is imputed on us by faith in what Christ has done. It's the greatest news ever. Good to see you guys. All right, thank you. Praise Jesus. Uh, well, Daniel, I'm glad you made it back. I, when you disappeared, I didn't know if you're gonna be able to come back, but uh, I asked Renee to do the gospel message. We need an exhortation, and if you want a song, uh, would you like to do a song or an exhortation as, as we finish? Sure, I could do a song. Okay, go ahead and do a song. First, give us a little summary remarks of uh, the time today. All right. Uh, I enjoyed the, uh, the questions. I know I wasn't here for the whole time, but... I'm glad I was able to come on for part of it, but um, it's always a pleasure to uh, 
join you guys and, and just to have a part in, in fellowship. So let me just go ahead and say something else. I'm going to see if my daughter might have a song she could play with me real quick. All right, great. I'll, I'll give a summary and uh, exhortation uh, while, while you're getting ready then. Uh, well, first of all, uh, um, yeah, I, I thought we might run out of questions here. We usually, uh, it's quite often, we don't get through five or six questions, uh, but we ended up getting through the final question. And good thing we uh, ran out of time because we didn't have an, another question ready. Uh, Heather asked us if, uh, or Ben, if uh, he's okay on the true fault uh, statements for the Friday program. So um, um, we always need more. So everybody who likes to be in the Friday Fun Fellowship Friday night, uh, if you could send some statements, uh, you can make any statement. Uh, you know, uh, is uh, the sky blue? True or false? No, no, the same. Sorry, the sky is blue. True or false? You make a statement and say true or false, and then the, we answer the question as a congregation, kind of look at uh, the breakdown of the answers, and and then uh, elaborate. So, yeah, we need, always need more of those, and uh, obviously we'd like to get more questions, uh, like uh, the questions we just discussed today. Uh, send all these things to the Church of the Eternally Secure at gmail.com. Um, yeah, it was a wonderful time as usual. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is uh, encouragement to uh, the congregation. Uh, a couple of the questions we came up with, I guess, uh, can be related to this in exhortation, and that is uh, confront your fears. Uh, if you're afraid of something, there's no shame in that. We're, we're all afraid. Of, if we weren't afraid of things, uh, uh, you wouldn't have the normal human responses. Something's not working right in your brain if you don't ever have any fears. Uh, but the, but courage is um, when you have fear, you don't let it stop you. You go forward in spite of your fear. So I would encourage everybody to do that. And then you'll find that whatever you are afraid of, when you, when you do it anyway, um, gradually by doing it with experience, you get better and better and the fear goes away. So I can tell you that I can. I think I can. I'm safe in promising you the fear will go away eventually if you continue confronting those those fears. Uh, the the other thing I'd say is uh, regarding the opening remarks I made about uh, Matthias leaving. I I hope everybody will uh, pray for Matthias and Paul, Paula and pray for his his ministry, and I hope you'll go to Talk and Doctrine and subscribe and 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 participate and give them so support what he's going to be doing there. So uh, thank you all, and uh, Brother uh, Daniel, uh, we're, we're ready for your, uh, if you're ready now, you, you got a summary remarks and also uh, uh, a song for us, right? You still, you there? Yeah, I'm here, sorry. I, uh, my friend was trying to call in and it kicks me off when I get a phone call, but anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll do, um, Amazing Grace, real quick, real quick. My daughter McKenna is going to play the violin with me. That's all right. Just, just go for it. She's, she says she needs to practice, but we'll practice while we're doing it. <laughs> all right, you ready? There you go. <laughs> There's amazing grace. You need to practice so bad. <laughs> it's all right. Well, well it's done. Good. Thank you. We appreciate that so much. Okay. Uh, all right. Daniel, do you have any, any closing thoughts? Oh, you did. You did. Um, not your, really. Your closing thoughts were, were, were yeah, so, I did. so short that I, I forgot them. Ah. <laughs> all right, brother. You you continue you continue to be a man of few words, but when you speak, it's always profound. So, all right.
Okay. Well, got- even a even a fool, even a fool when he holdeth his peace is counted wise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. I, that's a, that is really so much wisdom in that. If you're not so, if you want to impress people, don't try to talk a lot and impress them. Just keep silent, and they'll think, <laughs> "Wow, he's really, really smart." For some reason, that's what the Pro- Book of Proverbs tells us. Awesome. Um, all right, so everybody in the chat room, the congregation, thank you for being with us again today. Um, but Daniel, do you have a Bible study on uh, Tuesday? You going to do a Bible study on Tuesday, Daniel? All right, I assume he does. Normally on Tuesdays he does, so join him there. And uh, on the CES channel, uh, the next program, of course, is Wednesday night, uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time on the same channel, the Wednesday night Bible study. So look forward to seeing you all there. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.